All right, everyone, hello, hello. I hope you are enjoying this heat wave. I am not, but today I wanted to talk a little bit about one of my favorite characters um, in the Old Testament, and that is the Witch of Endor. By the way, if you want to see these videos two weeks earlier, consider subscribing to my Patreon, where you not only get all these videos, but also recipe cards, uh, specific deity profiles, and lots of other interesting things to look at. Video tiers start at $10 a month, so definitely consider checking it out. So for Christian witches, a lot of times uh, you see people mention that Saul, right, King Saul, got in trouble for consulting with a witch, and they often quote out of 1 Samuel 28 for that. But when they quote 1 Samuel 28, it tells me they didn't read 1 Samuel 28, you know what I mean? What they're really thinking of is actually 1 Chronicles, which is a big book of like rehashing the entire history of the religion of Judaism like up to the point of this writing, right? So in that it says, Saul died for the trespass that he had committed against the Lord in not having fulfilled the command of the Lord. Moreover, he had consulted a ghost to seek advice and did not seek the advice of the Lord. So he had him slain and the kingdom transferred to David, son of Jesse. There's a problem with this though. Saul absolutely did try and consult with God. <laughs> Like, if we look at 1 Samuel 28, it says, The Philistines mustered their fortresses, and they marched on Shunem and encamped, and Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine force, his heart trembled with fear, and Saul inquired of the Lord. But the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams, or by Udom, or by prophets. He tried his damnedest, right? We got the three typical Israelite methods of divination. We have dreams, where God really likes to pop in. We have the Udam and Thummim, right? To try and get those yes or no answers. Should I do this? Should I do that? No answer again. And we have prophets, who are all coming up dry. They just did not have anything from God. God was giving them complete radio silence. He was not by the phone. So what does Saul do? He goes to a medium. And the problem with this is that um, Saul had just outlawed this practice of Ovenida Oni, Ovenida Oni being uh, basically kind of this practice where you would you would put the bone of an animal in your mouth and you would get really high and you would like channel spirits up and get them to speak through your own mouth. That is the thing mentioned in like any of the typical Old Testament clobber verses like Deuteronomy, Leviticus, so on and so forth. If you see some kind of, you know, passage saying you can't do necromancy, you can't do soothsaying, you can't be a medium. This is what it's referring to. It is a Canaanite practice, it's a pagan practice, and therefore it is outside the bounds of what Israelites, who are supposed to be separated from these pagan cultures, are allowed to do. So obviously Saul's in a, in a bit of a pickle because God's not answering him no matter what way he uses that is approved. And so out of desperation, he actually tells these people to find him a medium, and he goes to the medium. And the, the medium he goes to is the Witch of Endor, and she's kind of like, why are you asking me to do this? Please, like, what? And he's like, no, just go ahead, just go do it, right? Like, literally, here's the passage. Saul disguised himself. He put on different clothes and set out with two men. They came to the woman by night, and he said, please divin for me by a ghost. Bring up for me the one I shall name to you. But the woman answered him, you know what Saul has done, how he banned the use of ghosts and familiar spirits in the land. So why are you laying a trap for me to get me killed? Red flag number one, that people constantly get the story wrong. She wasn't trying to do this. <laughs> she really wasn't. She wasn't trying to do this practice that uh, was not allowed, right? She didn't want to get put to death or imprisoned for it. She didn't want to mess with this. She was like, it is 9 p.m. at night, boy. Why are you here, right? But then Saul swore to her by the Lord, as the Lord lives, you won't get into trouble over this. And you may wonder, Saul, what authority do you have to swear by God about that when he won't even pick up the phone? But I digress. But he says to bring up Samuel, right? The Samuel, who the book is named after, is a prophet uh, who who pretty much told Saul that, hey, uh, you are going to get this kingdom boop, taken away from you and God's going to give it to David because you suck. So as you can see, kings and prophets didn't always get along throughout the Bible for obvious reasons. But when this woman brings up uh, the ghost of Samuel, she immediately recognizes who she's talking to through that disguise. She's like, wait a minute, you're Saul. What the hell is this? And Saul's like, don't worry about it, just what do you see, right? And she says, I see divine beings come up from the ground.
So we're gonna pause here to talk about this because this is the first really interesting part um, where she is bringing up a human soul and she calls it a divine being. And so in the footnotes of the Jewish study Bible, what's really interesting is it says that, you know, um, Sheol, the abode of the dead, was believed to be beneath the earth, and though dead, Samuel the prophet is still expected to be able to foretell the future. So only the witch of Endor could see the ghost, though? Like, she's describing, like, oh, he's an old man, he's wearing a robe, but only Saul um, and the witch can hear him, right? Now, another interesting part of the footnotes is that this is considered to be real, right? Not trickery. The Bible believes in the possibility of sorcery, soothsaying, and necromancy, but prohibits them as heathen practices, right? So this is the thing. A lot of people will say magic's not real, this and that. They'll say, oh no, this, this is charlatan's devil trick. No, the Bible totally acknowledges that these are real things people can do. These are real uh, practices people can perform. They're just not for the Israelites because they are Canaanite practices and the entire point of the Israelites is to separate themselves from other neighboring pagan tribes. Literally, this is something that Christians frequently do not understand. If you are not Jewish, you don't need to worry about separating yourself. You are already of the class of people that were being separated from. You are a Gentile. Congratulations. But anyway, so that divine being part is really interesting. Uh, the word used there is Elohim, which is the same word that is frequently used for God. So this would suggest, if we look at it, that human souls have a very divine quality to them that they are indeed fashioned in the image of god and therefore they are they are more than just you know weird little human souls i feel like a lot of magical practitioners make this case that we are just human that we aren't that great that we're not that strong but the entire existence of us is a divine phenomena our entire soul is inherently unique and different to other souls and of course there are belief systems where you can get reincarnated as like a fox or a bug or something and like you know what sure but you know it makes me think of like when you have a dog that people say oh they have a human soul because they just they just act a little different than other dogs they have this intelligence and this emotional capacity or at least it feels like it that's what it makes me think of human souls are inherently divine things right like and all souls are. So are the souls of the plants, so are the souls of the birds. They're all divine, but humans specifically are big, big, powerful souls that a witch can pull one up and say, I see a literal god coming up from the ground, right? That's pit stop number one. Number two, right, is when we get into the meat and potatoes of this. Remember Chronicles? They said, oh, it's because he consulted a ghost that god didn't like him. Whoever wrote Chronicles is getting this story a little bent because again, he didn't go to this medium first. He tried every avenue of talking to God first. The real reason that Saul is getting his whole booty handed to him by God personally is exactly and explicitly stated in Samuel. Because as Samuel's sitting here floating around as a ghost, right, of course he's annoyed. He's like, why did you bother me? I was resting in Sheol. Why am I here right now? But Saul says, what do I do? Like, what's going on? And Saul says, why do you ask me, seeing that the Lord has turned away from you and has become your adversary? The Lord has done for himself as he foretold through me. The Lord has torn the kingship out of your hands and has given it to your fellow, to David, because you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his wrath upon the Amalekites. Bing bong bong. Very simple. Apparently, according to this passage, God is already at odds with Saul before he ever even conceives of the idea of finding a medium. This whole idea that Saul got in trouble for consulting a witch? No. That is like... If anything, you could call that the cherry on, on the poop cake, but like, otherwise, that has no bearing on the situation. At this point, God has already given this man like 18 strikes and he's like, nope, no, just on principle, no, right? So this has nothing to do with Saul contacting this witch of Endor. Saul is in trouble expressly because he did not do what God told him, which is righteously screw up um, an entire tribe of people, but hey. And then this is like such a just ice cold read from Samuel. He goes, further, the Lord will deliver the Israelites who are with you into the hands of the Philistines. Tomorrow your sons and you will be with me. 
and the Lord will also deliver the Israelite forces into the hands of the Philistines. Basically saying, Samuel saying, tomorrow you and I are going to be rocking and shield together. You're, we're both going to be dead. All right? Like, prophets, dude. <laughs> prophets. But look, see, this prophet can still, even though he's dead, tell the future as a prophet of God. That's wild. If anything, what we can really slam Saul for is being a hypocrite for outlawing this practice just to find this woman who was clearly saying, I don't want to do that, I'll get in trouble, and then making her do it anyway. That's kind of a problem. That, to me, is a bigger problem than the fact that she knew how to do this at all. There are a lot of things I know how to do. Doesn't mean I do them, right? So, it is a question right now as we ask ourselves, is it a sin to have the knowledge of something we're not supposed to do? If we don't do it? I don't think so. And so I think this woman was coerced into doing something she didn't want to do, by the man who threatened the death penalty to people who do it. That in itself is a pretty messed up situation. I think we can all agree. So if anything, if we're gonna slam Saul for this behavior, it's that reason right there. And it has nothing to do with just contacting the medium in general. However, however the last part I wanna talk about of the Witch of Endor is something that I think everyone should appreciate about the Bible, not just as like a holy text, but as a story. And that is the humanity that the Witch of Endor shows to Saul at the end of this, right? It goes like this. So Samuel leaves, he's said his piece, he's gone. And at once, Saul flung himself prone to the ground, terrified by Samuel's words. Besides, there was no strength in him, for he had not eaten anything all day and night. The woman went up to Saul, and, seeing how greatly disturbed he was, she said to him, Your handmaid listened to you. I took my life in my hands and heeded the request you made of me. So now you listen to me. Let me set before you a bit of food. Eat, and then you will have the strength to go on your way. He refused, saying, I will not eat. But then his courtiers, as well as the woman, urged him. He listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the bed. The woman had a stall-fed calf in the house. She hastily slaughtered it and took flour and kneaded it and baked some unleavened cakes. She set this before Saul and his courtiers and they ate. Then they rose and left the same night. So that whole paragraph to me is, again, it's really important because Saul, yeah, he's kind of the the antagonist in this story now. We're, we're shifting our focus to David um, as the next hero of Israel and all that. But even then we see this kind of he's definitely portrayed still in a more empathetic sense than others have in the bible in the past like say um lot in sodom and gomorrah lot everyone knew was a dick and lot um his whole family was a mess and everyone knew that <laughs> here it's like yeah saul has done a lot wrong but like we get this emotional moment of saul like falling down terrified being too weak to get up again right just being in such despair and this witch this witch, right, who is doing these practices that are abominable, she takes him up and says, hey, don't just sit here and wallow, let me give you something to eat, right? She shows that compassion and empathy for him. And if we take out all of this as like a, like a holy text and just focus on the narrative and the story, this is a beautiful thing. Like the Witch of Endor is a wonderful character. She is, yeah, I mean, she's a medium and a necromancer and she's doing stuff she's not like, by the Israelite laws allowed to do, but she was trying not to do it in the first place and she shows herself to be a good person, right? She cares for other people even though she doesn't know them. And I mean, yeah, right, it's the king and all that, but still. And she's audacious about it too. She says, hey, I, right, uh, since you're the king, right, I, I am but a lowly peasant and all that, but I listen to you and now you're gonna listen to me. You're gonna come here and you're gonna eat, all right? Like very, very classic old, old woman behavior, <laughs> right? So, you know, she she shows that empathy in that regard. And even though Saul is now the bad guy in the story, and the Witch of Endor is not, like, a hero herself or anything, we see that there is this nuance and complexity to the characters of these biblical stories, right? It's not so cut and dry in them in, anymore. Like, if you look at the beginning stories, again, like I said, Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah, there's such very clear distinctions between Lot and Abraham. Like, there's so obviously foils of each other, one being pretty much just all bad, the other being pretty much just all good, right? But as we get further and further through time, we see these characters starting to act in really complex ways, and we start to get more and more of that humanity of people, even when they're not on the right side. And I think that that is something that 
people need to remember. This isn't like a story of haha Saul, you're terrible and bad. To me, as at least as a modern reader, this is a heart-wrenching story. This is a story of someone who has made mistakes, who has failed and now has to pay for it, and who is trying to drag other people into his mess with him. But these people are trying to help him too, right? They're trying to get him his strength back, they're trying to get him to understand um, that he needs to go on regardless, right? He can't just lay there in this lady's house <laughs> and never face the Philistines and never eventually get struck and die like he did, right? He, exactly as Samuel said, he died. <laughs> and so that's the end of that story for Saul, but I feel like a lot of people when they read the Bible, they're not looking for the narrative elements, the literary elements too, right? Like they're just looking for like, yup, here's the Bible and here's what we're told not to do, right? They're gonna read the story and say, oh, see, he contacted a ghost and that's why he, nope. He was doing all kinds of divination methods that didn't work. He had already been condemned, right? We get to this, we get this understanding. He's already been condemned because of his past actions or lack thereof. This is a really empathetic, moment where Saul for all of his misdeeds and all of his issues becomes a he becomes a sympathetic character right he is despairing and this witch who is a character that stereotypically would probably be seen as a villain or an enemy she is giving him this compassion and then nothing is ever said of the wish of Endor again we don't know what happens to her we don't know um like what goes on with her, if God ever walked over to her and said, hey, what the hell are you doing this uh, over and you do anything for it, said not to do it. Like, we don't know. The Witch of Endor, as far as we're concerned, she just goes on her merry way and that's it, <laughs> right? Like, nothing happens to her in this narrative. Nothing bad ha- in fact, she has expressly promised that nothing bad will happen to her and that's why she does this in the first place, so. When we read the Bible, it is insanely important to actually read it. Who would have guessed? So, again, overall, my reason for talking about this is both to show you that no, Saul did not- He did not go and, like, get in trouble for talking to a witch, but also, the witch is a very, like, cool character. She is a lovely- character, right? She has the skill and she's doing this thing and she's bringing up Samuel and she's like, oh my god, but she's also like kind of like a motherly figure. She's someone who's saying like, hey, dude, it's time for you to settle down, work it out, we'll, we'll get through it, right? Like, she's that sympathetic character. And that is something that most people will not pick up on when they talk about this story. They're always too busy focusing on the fact that this is a witch and she's uh, doing evil magics and all this kind of- No, she's doing a practice that isn't allowed because it's pagan, but she is still a human being with empathy and with feelings and with a sense of trying to help her fellow man, and that is extremely important when we need to- when we talk about these figures, right? And also in that- and again, in literary sense, right, that this woman contrasts Samuel, and then, like my footnotes here in the Bible say too, Samuel is really stern, he's giving it to him straight, he's telling Saul, hey, you screwed up, <laughs> real bad. And the Witch of Endor is like, okay, well, you know you screwed up, but listen, just, it's time to just settle down, right? So it's that, it's that like, a little bit of aftercare, after getting slapped around by a prophet, a dead prophet, at that. Again, if you guys want to study the Bible, I do really suggest the Jewish Study Bible, the Jewish Annotated New Testament, because these will have the footnotes you're looking for. For instance, there is no hell in these stories, there's Sheol, which is just like a general underworld. Think of like Hades or any other just general place that like all souls go, right? Like there is no uh, super crazy uh, death thing um, yet. And like even then in Jewish thought, like hell isn't really a place people go permanently like in a Christian thought. Hell is a place that at, at most people get dipped in to get like that spiritual acid bath and then they move on. If anything, people go to Sheol, which is just an underworld where you rest until the day that everyone is risen up again. And when we do this, when we read things like this, we get a much better perspective on the Bible, the people in it, they become humans again to us, right? Rather than just a list of names and like weird Bible facts, we have a human story again. And this is why the Bible, in my opinion, and in the opinions of some of my colleagues, is so divine. This is a divine book because it is such a human book, because it catalogs all of these incredible stories of people loving and, and hating and living and dying and doing all of these things and having more complex things happen to them than just, 
you broke a law so you died, right? Like a lot more complexity into the Bible and in God than just, oh, oops, you messed up, so now you're dead. Like, it's so funny to me that as Christians uh, who sit there and say, you know, forgiveness and all this other stuff, they will forever condemn someone who did an action, even if they repented, even if they so on. They will forever judge somebody by that action. That is wild. Because that's just not a Christian value. That's not a Jewish value. That's not a value that is present in the Bible to forever just condemn somebody, even after they repented, cleanse themselves, and so on. Like, you know? But, all in all, again, tell me what you think in the comments, and also tell me if there's another controversial figure that you really like from the Bible. So, I'll see you guys next week for a bit more chats on other witchy tips, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. See ya!